don't know. I mean, wrestling is like... It was the first thing that I was really successful at and the first thing that I was really good at and that I picked up quickly and that I was really dedicated to and that I was really passionate about. So as just like an artist and a performer or whatever, like it was the first thing I found that I really, really, I could really be good at. I mean, wrestling for sure is an art form. I view myself as a performing artist more so than a wrestler, more so than a sports entertainer. It's a blend of everything. It's a blend of choreographed performance. And then there's also the other end of the spectrum where it's all improv. That's incredible. And there's nothing else like that. And it blends like long-term storytelling. You know, there's storytelling that's your entire career. You know, my character arc lasts my whole career. From every single promotion I go to, from every single show I'm on, it's all one story, it's all one character arc. So to move wrestling forward, I... You just have to look at new ways to do it. You just have to be inspired by different things. You can't just look back at old wrestling or current wrestling and just keep doing the same old things. You have to look at other aspects of performing arts, other aspects of culture, and what's happening right now, what's cutting edge right now, and put that on the performance. That's the only way to move this forward and to just play on people's expectations of what wrestling is. You ask the average person what they think about professional wrestling and they'll think of you know, maybe they'll think of Hulk Hogan from the 80s, or they'll think of, like, Stone Cold Steve Austin, or The Rock from the late 90s, and maybe, like, Batista, who's in movies now, or John Cena, or something like that. Like, they have the very, very specific image of wrestling, and it's so much else. Like, it's, it's so deep, and it's so vast, and there's so many different styles, and so many different things happening. Most of my art is geared, at this point now, it's geared towards professional wrestling. It's geared towards that side of myself, that, that kind of goal. This is what the full calendar is going to look like. It's going to be on this pink paper. This is going to be, I don't know yet, <laughs> some kind of pink color, um, just to blend in with the background. And then this is going to be a layer of white, and this is going to be a layer of black. So right now, these are the films or the transparencies. This is what I use to make the screen. So each screen is a different color. So, right, we have pink, white, and black. First one we're going to do is the pink screen. So this is already made. And right now, this part here is hard, so no ink is going to pass through. And then the part here, which is lighter, this is... Um, there's no emulsion on here. So this screen stuff is the emulsion and then you can see it's not here and what's left is this really fine mesh. So when I bring the ink across this, the ink is going to pass through here and not here. So it's basically just a giant stencil. And this ink's really cool because it's, it's meant for t-shirts, it's meant for fabric, but it's got some like really cool, it's got like shimmer in it. It's got little bits of, of glitter. So it's on there. I'm gonna do something called flooding the screen. So I need to make sure that the image here is full of ink mm -hmm. before I print it. So I flood it. Make sure it's nice and loaded. And then I just apply some pressure. Make sure it's all the way down. And it is a little too sticky. So that means I put a little too much ink on there, but that's why I do a test print just to see. So there it is on there now. So there's the image, and this is just a test print. But again, it looks so cool. Like, I love the test print. There was like better than the actual print. I went to school for graphic design or communication design is what my degree says. You know, I was always attracted to art, but I like art that has a purpose to it. You know, that's what attracted me to graphic design is it's, I can be very creative, but there's a specific goal. I'm trying to convey a specific message. 
if it's a show flyer, to go to this show, to kind of capture what this band or what this wrestler or whatever the show is, try to capture that feel with a visual design and then convince people to want to experience this. That always really attracted me to graphic design versus just strictly visual art. So I was a huge fan of like Shepard Fairey who does Obey. I just loved that he took something from graffiti and was doing these posters and wheat pasting them onto the sides of buildings and just turned that into this empire of clothing lines and movies and speaking tours and things like that. Like I think that's so, that's so brilliant how to just repeat one image over and over again. And that's another thing that I was really attracted to is just the idea of it's basically one image that he's always had. It's always been this picture of Andre the Giant. And that has just been repeated and repeated and repeated. And something about that's just really cool. I love the idea of just like a bunch of posters up on like, you know, construction wall or something like that, that are just the same image over and over again. I mean, you can see it behind me. I do that with my posters. That's something that attracts me to silk screening because it is just repetition. You're printing the same image over and over and over again. And sometimes there's really interesting results that just kind of happen through the sheer repetition. So I'm gonna get ready to do the second layer. And this is where those registration marks come into play where I can now align the next color, which is going to be the white. So this is the name and then the month. Kind of interesting now that it's drying how the background layer catches the light where it shifts from like light to dark, which is kind of a neat effect that I didn't realize was gonna happen. So after school, I started, you know, I got a job at like a marketing company and a startup and all those things that we were supposed to do. And on the side, I was doing design and doing illustration and trying to create a style that would get me known as that and that I could work independently. And I started doing art shows through that. So I came up with a couple like projects that were, you know, based on other things. And I was doing art shows. I was doing silk screened posters and putting them up in galleries and stuff like that. And I was never all that successful with it. I don't think it was really... For a variety of reasons, I didn't meet my goals as an artist and I was a little frustrated and whatever. And I happened to be working with someone who ran this, um, this speaking series called Ignite Philly. It was a lot like TED Talks, but um, they were based in Philly and it was about people in Philadelphia doing really interesting things. And I happened to see Mike Quackenbush speak. And he was talking about like, the beauty of professional wrestling, what makes professional wrestling so interesting. I got to meet Mike and he invited us to do a free wrestling workshop at the Wrestle Factory. And I was like, not gonna do it. I was never athletic. I was never a theater kid. I was never any of these things. So I was just like, no. But I was always a huge professional wrestling fan. I loved it from the very beginning. So my friends were like, you gotta do it. Like, we're gonna do it, you have to do it. I was like, ugh, fine. So I did the workshop and it went okay. Like, I ran the ropes and I could do the things. I could take bumps and stuff like that. And there were 16 of us that started this class and there were only like four of us who passed it. And I was one of the four. If I'm one of the top four out of 16, like those are pretty good chances. You know, in a really short time, I kind of put all the art stuff aside and was just focusing my life on being a professional wrestler. Shortly thereafter, I signed up for full-time training and I was doing full-time ring crew and all that stuff. And everything I was doing was just based on wrestling. And even my visual design stuff, I switched to like working with more wrestlers as clients and designing for wrestling. And here I am, you know, I'm a full-time wrestler now. and. It is, has succeeded in being my whole life. And I feel like I'm much more successful as a wrestler than I was as a visual artist. This is a great one. I never thought to do this raspberry ink on the yellow paper, but it pops incredibly well. Mm -hmm. So now like when I'm doing designs later, I'll like keep this in mind. I feel like I learned from a lot of the mistakes I made as an artist. 
or at least as like a visual artist and a designer, and I'm able to kind of not make those mistakes again as a performer and as a wrestler. And the image is gone, ready to be uh, used for the next project. So I was wrestling in Chikara, and an interesting thing about the way they did things is these characters were created, the students or other wrestlers were given them, and then they were looking for people who could fit that role. So I was given the role of still life with apricots and pears, I fit that, I think, just because I was an artist. And there were some specific parameters for this character, some specific storylines that it had to fit. But luckily for me, and luckily for Blank, is we had a lot of leeway, and we can kind of make it our own. And we were trusted to handle this character on our own, because it was so weird and so different, and there was really no precedent for it. You know, I'm thankful we were trusted with that. And a logo, and then my old look. So, you know, I had to maintain this character in and out of Chikara. And once Chikara was shut down, I was kind of left with this choice, like, do I want to keep wrestling a Still Life with Apricots and Pears? Or do I want to create something new? Or do I want to evolve Still Life? And there was also this other caveat that I didn't own the rights to Still Life with Apricots and Pears. It was owned by Chikara. And not that I was necessarily worried anything was going to happen. I just wanted the peace of mind that I had my own thing, that I owned it. It, belonged, it was in my name, it was my creation and all of that. That's how I started the idea of evolving to eat a surreal. And I don't really look at it as if it's this new character. I didn't just stop still life and start Edith. I evolved it and I was very intentional about that. You know, I had a new set of gear made that I was gonna use as Edith, but I still wrestled as still life. And once I finally decided to change the name, it was just a simple name change. And I was lucky enough to align it with my episode of The Life Of on IWTV, where I got to talk all about why I was gonna change the name. So that was a nice kind of, a way to explain it and a way to, to capture this transition from Still Life to Edith. Do you feel any kind of way about leaving Still Life, that name behind? Yeah, I mean, Mostly I have a lot of equity in it, and mm -hmm. it's just kind of like, that's who I am, and it, it's a good name. Do you like it? I do like Edith. I okay. love Edith Surreal. I feel like it's still very, like, in that vein of, like, artsy, mm -hmm. and, like, very much who you are. I, that's why I picked the name. It's like, so it can be Edith, or, like, you know, when people are friendly, friendly okay. they call me Edie. I love Edie because it's dainty and feminine, you know what I mean? That's it's such like, a, And it's just, like, a classy name. It's just, like, a classic, well, like, it's, old it's, Hollywood, like, very, like... It's artsy. Edie, it's Edie Sedgwick. That's, that's where I got the name from oh, because I love her, but I was worried about people calling me Eddie. So that's oh, why I didn't go with Edie. Right. So it's, I always wanted to be Edie Surreal, um, but people are going to say Eddie all the time. I've loved everything. <laughs> everything you've ever been, period. Oh, thank you. I stand. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it is the same character. It's not any different. It's just more me and it's just a further evolution of still life it's almost like 
you know, when Pinocchio becomes a real boy or something like that. I went from a painting to a person. And just the kind of nature of my kind of place in wrestling where my personal life helps me build this connection with my fans and with the audience, I thought that having a human name, something that's a little bit more human, would help kind of build upon that and help help me connect with people more so. Well, Tricora is pretty interesting where we were just there to play characters. It was very intentional that these characters were not based on our personalities, per se. They were very separate from that. But I noticed it was really hard to connect with people. You know, when I was on social media and tweeting about storyline things, there was not a whole lot of traction. But anytime I talked about my personal life, people gravitated towards that. Whatever it was, whatever it was, it was, I just noticed people are much more interested in characters that can, they can connect with versus some kind of like fictional character. And then also like once I came out as first someone who was non-binary and then a trans woman, that just opened up a whole world where I was sharing very personal details about my transition and my personal life and people were just connecting with that. And it was always kind of a challenge for me because I enjoyed and I felt a sense of responsibility to be this out queer person, be a queer wrestler and a trans woman. Um, but it was also, it is really hard for me. And I go back and forth on how much I want to share about my life. You know, I did that whole IWTV, The Life of documentary, which was very personal. And I shared a lot of like intimate details about my life. And I'm proud of it. And I'm glad I did it. And I don't regret it. But I think back like, I'm not going to do that ever again. You know, it was really hard to see. Like, it's just a very specific snapshot of one month of my life. And so many things have already changed since then that I feel not embarrassed. That's not the right word, but just kind of, I don't know. It sucks that I have to put myself through pain to be the person that I'm supposed to be. You know, I feel this way whenever I do my injection or whenever I go for like laser hair removal for my face. It's just kind of a weird place to be in. So it is what it is though. Okay, so let's just walk through this. You know, people are always going to connect me with that time in my life. And things are already different a year later. And two years later, things are going to be different. And five years later, it's my life is going to be so different. So it's just, um, I don't know. It's just weird. And I think it just took a lot out of me to film that thing and to share such personal sides of my life that I, uh, I need a break from that for a while, I think. For so long, wrestling was, it was about protecting the business. hiding everything about it and trying to present it as if it was this real, live sport. And we don't have to do that anymore. You know, we can be upfront that it is scripted and... You know, I like to keep some of the, the secrets close to the chest. I think it's really interesting to play with that and to play with what's real, what's not. What are the expectations of things? It's a story. So right. two people coming in with different mindsets of what the story should be is just like the, always the hardest part for me. 
because some people want to get their shit in and like do moves and spots, which can be very frustrating. A couple things, like you, you, uh, do you want to tease the cross? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tease the okay. cross. Can you put it on me? Because I forgot which way to. Yeah, yeah, we yeah, can I rotate do. around like this, right? Okay. If I go this way, that's how we counter, right? Okay. Yeah. Can you get me back in it here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So like almost at the ropes, and then you can pull me back this way. The wrestling I like is obviously like I, I like Ring of Honor, Noah, New Japan, all that, shit like that. My favorite, actually, my favorite kind of wrestling is all Japan because of how many subtle storytelling things they do in the matches that you wouldn't. No, like they don't have a lot of promo segments and backstage shit. They solely tell you stories through the wrestling. And it's like, I can't even speak their language. And I know what the fuck they're saying to me because of how just good they are at wrestling. Right. And it's just like, not everybody always has the same goal with the story they want to tell in a wrestling match. They, they, you know, some people are like, all right, well, let's see how many people are going to be here. I might just get my shit in. So I have a, a gif for Twitter, like a clip to post. I just like, having good wrestling matches and making other people have fun. You can put the, you can step here and like, yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah, thank you. I like that. Stay standing for a second. Yeah. Okay, back. How'd it go? Good. It was very good. Uh, easy. Very easy match to call. And that's how you know a match is going to be good, is when you don't have to, like, argue. Like, everyone argues with you. That was the easiest. When, I, when you both have the same idea in mind of what are, like, when you focus on the same important part of the wrestling and not just, like, the actual moves and spots and shit. And the fact that we're both kind of similar wrestlers. Like, no one else, when I've ever wrestled them, has said, I want to do a Johnny Sane spot. I love Johnny Saints so much. No one ever wants to do that shit. So like, first thing she said is, I do a Johnny Saint thing, and I was like, yeah, this is awesome, dude. I just said, I just want a technical, technical wrestling tonight. That's all. That's all I want to do. It's quite a contrast, right? Dude, yeah, nobody does technical shit anymore. Nobody, like, I don't know. I think it's cool shit, but you don't get a lot of gifts of hammer locks and snapmare takedowns and shit like that. You get gifts of fucking neck drops and, and 450s to the outside, you know. Sucks that Twitter's a thing. <laughs> I hate it's the worst thing that's ever happened in wrestling is Twitter. My opinion. <laughs> yeah, it has. It's really important for, I think, all professional wrestling shows to have a women's division and to be split down the middle. You know, I think you need equal parts, men's matches, women's matches, have non-binary performers. It's, a, it's an ensemble and it should be a variety show. It's insane that there's still shows and promotions out there that don't have women on there. There's no excuse for that, and I'm not at all interested in that.
I want to fit in on as many shows as possible. And I think I add something different. That's what I, I mean, that's my goal is I want to add something different, add something unique to every single show that I'm on. And part of that is my character. Part of that is because I'm an artsy wrestler. Part of that is because I'm a queer wrestler. Part of that is because I'm a woman. All these things are, are different aspects that make me stand out a little bit versus the average wrestler you would see out there. Today is Bromatica, end of an era. This is the very last show we're doing at Vibe. Here where it all began for us, DC Brown, Washington, DC. And this is the culmination of all of our storylines and all of our things that have happened here in the last four years. Um, and Edith is a part of it. She is the first ever Cassandra Cup winner in 2021. And she is leading a team with Trisha Dora and a mystery partner uh, against Killian McMurphy, who won the 2022 one and called himself the gay president. And he has his cabinet. Saul Sparza and Rob Racky in a six-person tag team match. And they have been fighting over who is the better representative of the legacy that we're building with the Cassandra Cup. Uh, 
Killian's not a good guy. Edith is a superhero. So that's what we're doing here tonight. You know, I want to celebrate who I am. I want to celebrate being queer. And I want a chance to celebrate that part of myself. And we all do, but we also want to show that it is, I don't know, something more mundane, or it doesn't need to just be a special thing. It doesn't need to just be a handful of shows that happen during Pride Month in June. It's something that it can be there all year and it should be a part of every single show. I love having LGBTQ plus shows that are just a showcase of all of us. I love this community. I love my friends. I love this opportunity to show the world how incredible this community is. And the shows that we do, especially with Vibe and the Cassandra Cup are some of the highest rated shows in all of independent wrestling. And it just shows what a demand there is for the type of wrestling that we do and then the type of wrestlers that we are. I mean, if you really want the truth about wrestling, the truth about wrestling is that wrestling is art. Wrestling has always been an art form, and it is the art form of, of compelling stories about physicality. It is displaying the virtues and the trials and the tribulations and the psychological torment of violence and how our relationships form around violence. And that's how you get good guys and bad guys, and you get three-year storylines on mainstream television and on the independents, because the one thing everyone knows is violence and evil, because that's what, you know, depending on what you believe in, the world is born out of. So what we do is we, we tell the story of good and evil through the medium of a sport with rules that make no sense. We are actors first and foremost, because we know who's gonna win and we know who's gonna lose, and that's totally fine. If you ask Ric Flair, if you ask The Undertaker, if you ask Trish Stratus, if you ask John Cena, if you ask Bianca Belair, Becky Lynch, if you ask Kelly McMurphy, Edith Surreal, Billy Dixon, the juice to the squeeze is the moment that you suspend disbelief completely. That is not a sport, that's art. Oh, my damn back. What the hell? But to quote Effie, wrestling's gay. Always has been, always will be. What we do is incredibly homoerotic and that's totally fine. Um, but also, if you think about who invented the Royal Rumble, who was instrumental in the storytelling for WrestleMania, Vince McMahon was not that person, it was Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson, late in life, came out as gay. Um, queer minds have always been on the forefront of entertainment mediums. You know, I am, incredibly blessed to have been somebody who had the opportunity to uh, move things forward with telling queer stories and employing queer people in all facets of what we do here. But there have been people before I was even born fighting the fight every step of the way, some people doing it stealth, some people being able to be out and dealing with atrocities because of that. And I think that what you're seeing now is we're finding that performers with something interesting and something new to say tend to be more queer. And I think with queer shows, there's this element of come as you are and being comfortable and being safe that I think because of our shared struggle, we leave a lot of judgment at the door and um, we let it be all about what's in the ring. It's always been a safe space for, you know, 
underrepresented wrestlers and fans, you know, that's always been like the ethos here. And it's been something we've been building for a couple years now. And, you know, unfortunately due to stuff with the local athletic commission, it, it, it's just not feasible anymore, which is just like really, really unfortunate because, you know, with the state of the world today or the state of this country, um, we need safe spaces and we need places fighting for us to be able to perform and to be a community and, and, and to do all these things together. And that's being threatened all across the government and the DC Athletic Commission, who's not even, doesn't even have a stake in any of that stuff, is making it so we can't perform here anymore and, and have this space. So it's just, it's, it sucks. <laughs> it really sucks. It's disappointing. I mean, it's bittersweet to have like, you know, I'm really happy with my match, but it's, um, I hope this isn't the end. I hope we figure something out. But. Okay, there may be people who do not want to see what we have continue forever. So let's show them the power of love and community. And there is nothing that is bigger or better than love and community. Unfortunately, yeah, I would love to say that, like, as my last show, like, I can walk away knowing that queer wrestling is in great hands, and it is, because there's so many all queer companies on the independents, but I think that the struggle is that the people making the decisions, writing the shows, we don't have people in the writing rooms, we don't have people in, 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 in the positions of influence. The, the hurdle is when you go from independent to mainstream. And even on the independents, there are still hurdles, both visible and invisible, that queer folks are having to jump through and figure out how to maneuver around in order to be successful. You know, the Edith Surreal character is a source of strength and inspiration for a lot of people, and I want to always be that. But yeah, I am scared. It sucks, you know. Just being on Twitter every day and listening to the news or whatever, like, it's just this constant attack on people like me. And Florida, of course, has gotten a lot of attention. Governor Ron DeSantis there has led the passage of multiple new laws targeting gay people and trans people. This bill will further harm trans people who are literally just living their lives. Oh, Better Falls, get the rope! Better Falls, get the rope! Transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. This bill threatens to not only bar me from receiving this care, but also from accessing the hormones that have single-handedly not only improved, but saved my life. I will not stand for legislating hate into our statutes. You can't wear this, you can't wear that. There's no doctors that'll treat you. They become suicidal. It's like we have mutants living among us on planet Earth. The Lord rebuke you, Satan, and all of your demons and all of your imps who come and par par parade before us. That's right, I called you demons and imps. When I first came out, it felt like a very different world. And now it feels like I was misled <laughs> by the world on, on what's safe for me. So now I'm second guessing going to the bathroom and where I'm traveling and you know, I, I, I want to put on that brave face and be a source of inspiration, but at the same time, educating people, because a lot of people don't know this stuff is happening. You know, a lot of my friends don't know that it's happening, or, or my family doesn't really know, because it's not getting out there like it should. And a lot of people will brush it off, like, oh, it's just one bill, it's not even going to pass, that's unconstitutional, whatever. But, like, it's happening. It's happening in Texas, it's happening in Florida, it's happening in Tennessee, and it's scary, because... We're just here to perform for people. And they're making it seem like we're, I don't, even, I don't even know. I don't even know what they're thinking. The way these bills are written is they're intentionally vague and they can attack trans people for just existing. For me being trans in public or me tran being trans and performing, it's gonna be illegal and say, you can't do it within X amount of feet of a minor or it has to be in, you know, cabaret halls or whatever, like their ar archaic languages. And that's going to mean I can't perform in certain states. Um, and if what happens in two years and the Republicans take, you know, take the presidency, it could be a federal law. You know, we're look. That's the, the path is being laid out right now. So it's scary, and and I want more people to know about it, and I want more people to realize what's happening and and what's on the table for people like me.
This was the scene outside Drag Queen Story Hour at Loyalty Bookstore in Silver Spring Saturday after several members of the far right group, the Proud Boys, showed up. They were shouting transphobic, homophobic, homophobic slogans. They come and say, you know, we will scare your children. We will terrorize families in the hopes that you will decide not to be loud and proud in your support of the LGBTQIA plus community. So there was a um, there was a drag queen story hour, and they've they've done a lot of those more in the summer uh, when school's out. But since there had been some disruptions in the past, there tend to be a, a good contingent of people who come out just to support, make sure it stays positive, make sure that everything is kind of upbeat for the kids. And if there are any crazies, that um, the kids aren't you know having to look at people yelling obscenities at them. Um, just to make sure the whole thing goes off without a hitch. We had a, we had a good group of people, probably about 40 of us out there, and there was a, a small group, maybe a dozen or so Proud Boys, that uh, came and tried to rush and break into the, uh, the bookstore where it was happening, and we were just, you know, a wall, trying to keep the whole place safe. Uh, so I got a little ding on the nose from that. You know, with a lot of the right-wing pushback on just the existence of people, um, I, I don't know that anything would be shocking. But uh, what's what's really been uplifting is the response to it from communities like this. Uh, you see a lot of solidarity across socioeconomic and color lines. Uh, just we we have formed a really big community that looks out for each other, and that's that's been really inspiring to see. You know, right now I just want to keep getting better at my craft. You know, I don't think that my performance is there yet. I don't think that my technical skills are there yet. I want to keep working at that and become a really, really good wrestler and then start to branch out and to do other things that still involve wrestling. And I don't know what those things are yet, but talking about goals is funny to me because as an artist and like a designer, like I had all these really specific goals and... I never met them, and it was, like, kind of discouraging. So with wrestling, I tried not to have any. I just kind of am going along for the ride, and from day one, I was just saying yes to everything. Every opportunity that came along, I was like, yeah, sure, why not? So I'm trying to keep that attitude of just seeing where it takes me. Um, and maybe that's, like, another lesson I learned as a designer, and, you know, from that, that life. It's just, you know, just to go, just to go with the flow and see where it takes me. You know, this is my fourth year in wrestling, so I have some goals of, like, how much I want to wrestle and how much money I need to make per month to make this, like, my full-time job and to make it my whole life. There's some things I need to accomplish first, but I don't know. As I don't know what my end goals are. <laughs> you know, I'm still just long for the ride and I want to make something bigger. I want to do something really grand with it. Um, but I don't know what it is yet. <laughs>